Hi everyone, Ali at My Safe Place here. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you're all having a great day. Um, that's my daughter's cat in the background there. That's Miss Maury. She is named after a character um, in the film Pacific Rim. Um, a very tough character that my daughter really uh, enjoyed. So uh, that's Miss Maury, otherwise known as Mo. Um, and she's... Uh, probably going to pull a lot of focus even from me because I we just love her she's just so cute um, I've had this this uh, video ruminating for uh, a little while and things are becoming more and more clear so I thought it might be time to share a little bit of it with you um, I'm still working on the um, shamanic mentorship program uh, with our mentor who is um, most of the people in the in the group also um, see him as um, naturopathic uh, physician patients and that's how we got in contact in the group the group is really um, an incredible group of very open-hearted warm loving people um, and I'm really grateful uh, that I get this opportunity to do this work because I think it's an important piece um, as I move towards um, better balance and healing in my life. And one of the themes that has been coming up for almost everybody in the group, uh, and, and thematically we are incredibly similar, um, which is very interesting uh, to observe, uh, because what we do uh, at the beginning of each um, group session, and we meet about once a month, and do work in between um, is we set our intention for that day's shamanic journeying work and um, those intentions are uh, often not crystallized yet they haven't been completely uh, made clear so oftentimes when it's our turn to stand up and speak about our intentions for that day um, sometimes we've rehearsed them and find that everything has gone out the window uh, and other times uh, we're actually uh, actively asking for help to help us define more clearly what's going on for us and how to set that as a as an intention that will work for the day and um, we help each other with questions um, we try you know part of the shamanic journeying work is not to define things for people so um, this past Sunday, uh, we had a class and um, everyone was standing up and either stating very clearly what their intention was or um, needing help uh, clarifying. And um, as has happened several times before, just based on where we're sitting and where I'm sitting, um, I was second to last. And by the time it gets around to me, um, as someone who's uh, always been uh, very em empathic or empathetic or however you put it, uh, by the time it got to me, especially this Sunday, I was completely and utterly overwhelmed by what everyone else was talking about. And while there are very common threads in all of our intentions and uh, very common themes, shared themes, um, there are very uh, unique uh, approaches and uh, ideology around it, depending on who's who's uh, speaking. And so by the time it got to my turn, all I could say was, I don't mean to be flippant, but what they said, um, <laughs> meaning that uh, I was feeling so much of what everybody else in my group was feeling that I was completely incapable of describing or talking about what my intentions were because I was so overwhelmed by everyone else's including the people who were saying they were having difficulty feeling because uh, that's their journey is to, to get deeper and feel more I could actually feel them not feeling and I don't know if any of you can can relate to that um, and I, I belong to a couple of um, social media groups uh, for empath support and everyone always talks about more grounding and more shielding. And I got to tell you, grounding and shielding would have been useless for me in this situation. And what became 
the main thing that became really clear for me, and I had had、um, a naturopathic session、uh, with our mentor the day before, where we had discussed and touched on this just a little bit. But what was going on for me mostly was、um, boundaries or complete lack thereof. And my feeling about feeling everybody's feelings. Sorry to be so obtuse and roundabout with that.、Um, was that it was、uh, completely wrong, completely inappropriate for me, and also inappropriate for the people with whom I was sharing the space. So it suddenly became apparent that that my empathy and my ability. Or whatever you, word you want to use there to feel everybody's feelings, which I've always kind of had, and which is a, a learned response. It's a survival mechanism for someone like me who was raised by a narcissistic parent, specifically my mother.、Uh, it, it was imperative for my survival that I learn to feel her feelings. So it occurred to me that because I already know this, and because that this. Feeling other people's feelings and not having any clearly delineated boundaries, and having difficulty in the past, anyway, telling the difference between what was mine and what belonged to someone else. I understood for the very first time that, at least、uh, in my case, and I'm not speaking for everyone here, so please don't inundate me with comments about how I'm wrong because everybody's got their own unique experience of this. And so trust that for you, and do what works for you. But I suddenly realized that my empathy, as a survival mechanism, was actually a sign and a symptom of trauma. And having failed to individuate from a psychological perspective, and having failed to be allowed to into or taught to individuate by my、uh, family of origin. Uh, created a response, an automatic response in me that is the equivalent of, in my opinion, it is the equivalent of fight or flight, or freeze or fawn. In my case, it's feel. So, in what I'm trying to get at here is, the more I'm feeling someone else's feelings,、um, the more、uh, in fight or flight response I actually am. The more traumatized I actually am, so it's a sign and a symptom for me、um, that I'm not in a healthy place. And this may be different for different empaths, but I can tell you right now that as someone who has empathized and felt other people's feelings for my whole life and had difficulty telling the difference between what was mine and what was someone else's, I'm now understanding that this is actually a symptom. That I need to heal. So there is a very distinct possibility that I will actually have less of an ability to feel other people's feelings as I heal, and I'm convinced I am healing because I'm now beginning to be able to tell the difference between what's mine and what's someone else's, and it's excruciating. I got to tell you, that this healing process of healing my empathy is excruciating because there's so much. Positive reinforcement for both empathy and empaths, and what I mean by that is very few people have spoken about, or I don't know, maybe they're out there and I just haven't seen them yet. Speak about how being an empath might actually be a symptom of trauma, and might actually be something that you need to adjust. And the other thing that I was feeling as I was feeling other people's feelings intensely. Was the feeling that I was invading their privacy? I have the feeling now, and the sense now, and the ideology around the idea that that feeling other people's feelings in this completely open and boundaryless way is actually a violation of their sacred energetic space, and I have zero desire to continue that. It became very clear in、um, in the session, and I was able to say quite quickly that I needed to work on my boundaries、uh, last this past Sunday in the shamanic group. 
And I was, and, um, our mentor said, thank you for sharing that. And, uh, said, I didn't need to go any deeper, but I did need to say one more thing. And what I said was, I apologize because I realized that me having no boundaries and reaching in and feeling you, even though I have no control, especially because I have no control of it is actually a violation of your space. And I apologize for that because there was no consent. Now, perhaps some people could say that when we're getting together in a group like this and opening up like this, there is tacit or implicit consent. And I think there's implicit consent and, <coughs> excuse me, tacit consent for us to be sharing, but not necessarily to be feeling someone feel, someone's feelings. And I was talking to a very good friend of mine who really understands what it is to be in complex PTSD. Uh, if anybody knows what's going on here, it's her. And she's an incredibly empathic person and sensitive person and deeply kind and generous. And she didn't quite understand what I meant when I said, I feel like it's a violation. And the more I talked about it, the more she actually began to understand that it kind of is a violation of someone else's space to be feeling their feelings. And I understand where it comes from. In, in both of our situations, actually, being raised by um, mentally ill and cluster B parents, it was a requirement that we feel their feelings in order to feel, fulfill their needs. So our needs weren't met, but in order to fulfill theirs, we had to feel their feelings. So it became a survival mechanism. In much the same way, um, fight, fighting is a survival mechanism. Mechanism fleeing is a survival mechanism. Fawning, um, and even as uh, Shrinking Violet has said in one of her past videos, fornicating can be a survival mechanism. So I'm going to add one more to that, and I'm going to say feeling. Other people's feelings can be a survival mechanism, and it can be as automatic and uncontrollable and unconscious as fight or flight. So in order to be able to heal this, I think we have to come to terms with the fact, for some of us anyway, not for everybody, I know it's true for me, that if I want to heal, I am going to have to stop feeling people's feelings, certainly without their permission. If they were to engage with me in a shamanic session or I decided I was going to take up um, clinical hypnotherapy again or NLP work again or whatever, and someone was coming to me and saying, I'm having trouble feeling my feelings, couldn't you, can you help? That's a whole different story. That's a whole different story than me walking into a group and just taking all this stuff on and invading their privacy without uh, their consent. And my friend also brought up another um, interesting question. She asked me, well, uh, how do they, how do they feel? Um, how do they even know they're being violated? And I said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, they may not be conscious that they're being violated. And this goes across the board for consent. Someone doesn't have to be conscious. In fact, the less conscious they are, the less right we have to be invading that sacred space. I don't know if that makes any sense to, to you, but that's kind of where I'm at. And I may totally change my mind or change my opinion on this, but I'm really feeling very strongly then it, that grounding and shielding, which I've been doing forever and simply does not work, especially when you're in trauma, like I am currently, and nothing showed that to me more than what happened this past Sunday, um, that the grounding and shielding certainly helps. But until I develop really firm, uh, distinct, I'm going to say distinct rather than firm, distinct boundaries, because boundaries are not walls and they are not shields. They are much more flexible. And they can change given your situation. So until my boundaries are distinct and cohesive and very, very conscious, I don't think I, um, as an empath, should just be empathing everybody haphazardly as it comes in. I have to learn how to actually shut that down. And if it means leaving the room and shutting that down and thinking about what my boundaries are and thinking about what a violation this is on someone else's space, then that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to be meditating on this and I'm going to be cleansing and clearing. But really, at the core issue of this, 
<clears throat> excuse me, is what I believe to be um, healing, healing my trauma. Because the more I heal, the stronger and more distinct and cohesive and conscious um, my boundaries become. And as my boundaries become more cohesive, and more clear and distinct in my mind so that I can consciously use them, I'm going to be able to be more respectful of other people's space. And in so doing, because right now I can't hold the space for anybody. And people ask me, what does even holding the space mean? Well, holding the space means allowing someone to feel what they're feeling and giving them the space to do whatever that is um, without infringing upon that. That's what holding the space means. And right now I can't even hold the space for myself, let alone anybody else, because I've got all this stuff coming in and I've got no filter and I've got no boundary. And even if other people might have boundaries, I'm still picking up their stuff. And that's what a narcissist taught me to do. So do I really want to be continuing the same patterns that I learned being raised by a narcissist. Hell no. Hell no. It's a symptom of my dysfunction. It needs to change. I don't know if that makes sense to other people, and I may be um, changing my opinion or adjusting as this healing continues, and I'm really hoping that I have more concrete ways uh, of uh, building these concise boundaries and healing that old trauma so that I'm not just an open sore sucking it all in, all this bacteria, <laughs> all these feelings, and so that I can make some changes to this automatic uh, feel response that I have that's clearly no longer working for me. Um, and I've asked for this. I went into this eyes wide open. I said, I want to do this healing work. Um, I have to accept the stuff that's coming with it. That being said, it's always our choice how far we go. And I really feel like that if, as an empath, it's uncomfortable for me, then it's sure as hell probably uncomfortable for the other person. And there is nothing healthy about that kind of discomfort. It's the same thing as keeping a secret about a physical violation. If it's uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable for a reason, and it needs to be healed. That's just my thoughts on the idea. Let's see where it goes from here. Um, I hope you all have a great day, um, and thanks for watching.